Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today we are going to be talking about a bunch of classic books. So I really like reading. I mostly read, you know, like fantasy or romance. That's kind of the main two things I've been reading recently, but once in a while I like to pick up a classic, um, even though I wouldn't necessarily call myself a, a literary person. I have a bunch of classics on my shelf of books that I haven't read yet that I really want to read but that I'm kind of intimidated by. And I know that a lot of people like me feel this kind of intimidation about classic books, literature books, English literature books, because you're kind of like, what if I don't get it? You know? An example that I can give this is kind of, I don't know, maybe embarrassing to admit, but a few years ago I read To the Lighthouse by Virginia Woolf. Popular classic, you know, Virginia Woolf, very well known. And I only gave it two stars because I only thought it was kind of fine, but I knew that I was probably missing something. I really felt like I was missing some information on why this is so good. I felt like I needed someone to mansplain the book to me, some English major telling me why this is actually really good. And for example, another example, one of the books that I really enjoyed reading for required reading in secondary school for English was The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald. But I know that one of the main reasons that I actually enjoyed it so much is because our English teacher went over the chapters with us every week and explained the symbolism and the meaning and the green light and all that. And if I didn't have that, I probably would have enjoyed the book so much less. But of course, you don't really have that information all the time. And because of that, sometimes it can feel kind of intimidating to pick up a classic book, especially if you're not very familiar with it yet. And obviously, of course, you don't need an English degree or a literature degree to enjoy classic books. It's something that kind of comes up with the time. Once you read more, you kind of get better at the skills and you hear people talk about these books and you read stuff online and it gets easier. But today I just wanted to talk about some, I guess you could call them beginner classics, the type of classic books that I think anyone can enjoy or for which the context I think is very easily identifiable. Ooh, oh boy. <laughs> Sorry books. It's really been a while since I've been reading a lot of classics. Lately I've just been on a romance kick. I actually have a video of me reading romance books. You can watch it up here if you want to, but today we're switching it around and we're talking about classics again. So the first book that I want to recommend, I don't actually have a copy of with me, but it is The Little Prince by, I'm gonna be really bad at pronouncing the <laughs> name of the author, Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. This is technically a children's story, but it's one of those children's stories that have become a classic because they can be enjoyed at every age. And especially, it's really a good book to revisit multiple times. Maybe you've already read it, in which case, revisit it and read it again, maybe. It's about a little prince. Wow, of course. <laughs> On a little planet and he meets I guess basically the author, like the person who's narrating, and they kind of go on this journey across multiple little planets where they meet very interesting characters. And every little character is kind of learning or teaching the reader a lesson about the world. It's really one of those books where you can tell that little details, little messages that we give to kids remain super relevant even as adults. It's about friendship and innocence, but also kind of gives a kind of like criticism of, you know, like stern adults and their corporate jobs <laughs> and how they always want more and more money etc. It reads a little young because of course it's written for children but I don't think it diminishes the value of the book at all and it also makes it technically pretty easy to read. I mean it's literally a children's book so I would say that is the type of classic that counts as a classic where you don't need a literature degree to understand what's going on. You just need a little bit of childlike imagination and appreciation for these kind of simple but packed full of meaning stories. Then let me grab... I did not put this in the right order. <laughs> I have a bunch of classic dystopians because I feel like dystopians are exactly the kind of books that can be read and understood by everyone even if you're not very used to reading classics yet. They tend to have very clear 
and outspoken messages and ideas that they want to get across. So the writing style is usually quite simple and to be fair, usually the characters are even underdeveloped. They tend to be very clear criticisms of society and I think anyone can read that because anyone probably can have an opinion about society and the world around you. You don't need to know a lot of like subtext, lyrical knowledge. I'll try to give some historical context for the books that I'm going to mention because that is usually the only thing that is good to know when you get into a dystopian. So let's just start off with like the most obvious one and that is in 1984 by George Orwell. This was published in 1950 which is very relevant for a book which main message is anti-totalitarianism which was totalitarianism and authoritative governments were definitely a problem back then with the Soviet Union in Europe for example. It's a story of Winston Churchill. No it's not about Winston Churchill. What? Winston. Winston Smith. <laughs> he works for this future authoritarian government. He works for the Ministry of Truth where he kind of works on deciding what is the truth and what is a lie but slowly he kind of starts to question the government that is in place he joins like a rebellion group and things start happening from there everything in this dystopian world is kind of a hint of ways that authoritarianism can influence the way people think like the government deciding what is truth and what is a lie the government changing the language making it simpler easier devoid of any nuance and meaning because the language you use will then have influence on the way people think. The very famous oh two plus two is five scene is basically um I don't know I think a government official <laughs> forcing the main character to say that two plus two is five because if the government says that it is then it's true. And another reason I would recommend this it also reads pretty easily. In a way it kind of is similar to you know like young adult dystopians in that it is a fun exciting story you are following Winston as he meets people and tries to avoid the government officials and is joining this rebellion it's fun and exciting and like pretty thrilling at multiple points there are definitely huge chunks in this books of just political ideas spelled out instead of being neatly interwoven into the text but because of that it was also pretty hard to miss the point and pretty easy to understand. So I would recommend this. It's fun. It's good. It remains a classic for a reason. I think everyone should read this. Then the other one, if you've watched any of my other videos, you know which one is coming. <laughs> that is Brave New World by Algeus Huxley. In my opinion, the best of the dystopian classics that I've read. Here, the dystopian world is not so much about totalitarianism, but more about, I guess, like, corporate totalitarianism, you could say, complete hedonism, consumerism, mass production, etc. This was published in the 1930s. Yes, which is also the exact year that the idea of PR came up. So that was the time when basically we invented the concept of advertising people things that they don't need. Like that was a thing that was actually invented at some point. Because usually people would advertise like, oh, you have a broken shoe? Here, buy our new shoe. And at that point they realized, what if we just tell people that even if their shoe is still good, they still want this new cooler shoe. That will bring us sales. <laughs> kind of the start of consumerism and you can see that the book is very much influenced by that idea. There are so many things in this book where I was like, whoop, this is straight up just correctly predicting our current way of living <laughs> where things just get like thrown away after one time use things like that there's also some bits about reading and reading for fun in here which i think is fun to read about if you're a book lover in this world nobody really reads books <laughs> at least not like literature because the idea is you should only be reading things and doing things that make you 100% happy and things like Shakespeare will just make you sad which is bad but then they talk about it and it's like well maybe sometimes it's good to be sad a little bit because it means you're enjoying a piece of literature a whole which I think we can all kind of relate to in a way I just noticed that there's like a 3d glasses in here Wow, it's because the cover is like, oh, oh, 
Whoa, that actually works. <laughs> it's because the cover is 3D. Again, super easy to get through and very fun to think about. And then the last one that I want to recommend, an absolute red flag book. I know, but it's still good, okay? Don't let that stop you. It is A Clockwork Orange by Anthony Burgess. Now, is this book that you definitely need a lot of knowledge on literature for to understand? No. Is the book therefore easy to read? Absolutely not. <laughs> but don't let that stop you. Let me explain to you why. We'll get to why you should still read it anyway. But basically, um, this is the story about a bunch of teenagers or just like young guys that are just super violent, just go around attacking people, killing people. It's honestly super horrible. And it's about how violence is just completely rampant everywhere. And then the main character kind of gets taken into this even what to call it like an institution where they are going to teach him to not be as violent anymore in this really horrifying way i'm sh sure you're familiar with like this scene in the movie where they like keep his eyes open and he has to watch like certain movies um that will teach him to no longer be violent and it's kind of basically they're using violence to make this main character less violent. And it's kind of about that and how he's experiencing it. And it makes you think about morality and ethics. But the reason this is hard to read is because we are following these teenagers and this book is full, and I mean full and full of made up slang. Um, let me just read the first few sentences to you so you can kind of get an idea of how this book reads, okay? <clears throat> Oh, this is the introduction. <laughs> Here's a sentence from the first page. They had no license for selling liquor, but there was no law yet against prodding some of the new veshes, which they used to put into the old Moloko, so you could peat it with velochet or synthamesk or denkrum or one or two other veshes, which would give you a nice quiet horror show 15 minutes admiring Bog and all his holy angels and saints in your left shoe with lights bursting all over your mosque. I guess you could say that the way this book is written is violence to your brain. Um, which I actually, that might have been the point. And I actually like that it's written this way because it kind of brings across this like violent atmosphere. But I found it like a fun challenge to try to read this book and to try to understand it. Because at first you're just constantly frustrated because you're like, what the hell does this mean? You can look up a glossary online of all the slang words, but the more you read, the easier it gets and you start to understand what all these words mean and just from context and that makes it very satisfying. I think even if you have an English degree, this is gonna be difficult to read. So, you know, the playing field is level here. We're all on the same boat. <laughs> then we are going to move on to one of my new absolute favorites and that is The Yellow Wallpaper by Charlotte Pilke per Perkins. I always mess up her name. So for this one, you do actually really require the historical context to fully appreciate the story. But, but hear me out. This edition has a fore and afterward. And because it's a short story, they can basically explain the entire book to you. They give all the historical context, all the context of the author's life and what inspired the author to write this book. It can give examples of sentences from the short story and what they mean and what the symbolism is. So that after you finish this book, you know that you have fully understood what is going on without needing like a teacher to explain it to you because everything is in this little tiny book. So I actually think that this book might be a perfect introduction to kind of literary analysis. I definitely learned a lot from it and it made me, I think it might be one of the reasons why I love this book so much because I was given so much of the context and so much of the conversations that were being had around this book back in the day. So the edition that I have, in case you also wanna have the same edition, is the Virago Modern Classics edition with an introduction by Maggie O'Farrell. I actually, um, I highlighted stuff in this. Like, oh, I feel so cool. Look, I actually highlighted things. Like, whole paragraphs and shit. Very cool girl of me. <laughs> this is a story about a woman who gets diagnosed with 
I don't know what it is. Is it hysteria? It's not hysteria, but something similar. That's basically what we now know is postpartum depression. Back in the day, the cure for this, for women specifically, was to just sit in a room for a few weeks until it passes because they believed that if you just don't think, you shouldn't think, you shouldn't have thoughts, no thoughts in your brain, then you'll get better. And this actually also happened to the author and it's about this woman that basically gets locked up in this top, uh, I wanna say penthouse, but like the 19th century version of a penthouse, <laughs> just at the top of the house where she can look over the countryside and she's just stuck there. And the only thing to keep her mind busy is this yellow wallpaper that's slowly starting to move and you start seeing things in there. And it's just kind of a corruption arc of her slowly losing it. It's technically horror, but it's the kind of horror that really shook 18th century people in their boots or their mules. It's not the kind of horror that will shake a 21st century person in their vans, so. It's okay. If you're not a fan of horror, you can probably still take this. And it's wonderful and I will never stop recommending this book, so please read it. <laughs> then we have a book that I recently read. Um, I technically haven't finished this completely yet, but I already know that I love this book. And that is Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. So a bit of context on this book that I know because I did a presentation on this book when I was in secondary school. Didn't read the book, but I did do a presentation on it. But if I remember it correctly, Mary Shelley actually came up with the story while on a vacation with her friends. And her and her friends would all go around a circle and talk about a horror story, explain a horror story to each other. And when it was Mary Shelley's turn, she told them this story about this scientist that was creating this monster and bringing the dead to life. And everyone in the room was like so scared by it and really loved the story. So eventually she turned it into a full length novel, but it started with just sitting with your friends telling each other horror stories. That's how this book started. And I think that's actually a really funny story, but it really is a story about humanity. First, we really follow Victor's, Victor Frankenstein's life and what is propelling him to make this monster and like his ambition and his thirst for knowledge and the science. But then we also follow the perspective of Frankenstein's monster, who is obviously a monster, Though. but he really wants to try to fit in with humans and he really tries to make friends with humans but it just doesn't really work for him and he's thinking about who he is and why he was created basically he has a full-on existential crisis so relatable you don't need to have a lot of literary knowledge to <laughs> relate to an existential crisis, I think. It does read kind of slow and it definitely has that 19th century writing style, but I did actually find it very nice to read. One of those classics that I was reading where I was like, whoa, I actually really love the way that this is written, which is not a thought that often occurs to me. Usually the writing style doesn't make a huge impact on me or it's not really something that I notice. I'm more of a story person. But when I was reading Frankenstein, I was like, damn, this is just like beautifully written. And I noticed that I'm enjoying this book more because of how beautifully it is written without being hard to read. So I think it really hits that sweet spot, that sweet spot of beautiful lyrical writing, but still also if you're not very used to that, it can be a good beginner book, you know? So Frankenstein, great. The next one that I want to recommend is another very small one, one that is very quick to get through. It is only a hundred pages and that is The Outsider by Albert Camus. Albert Camus is actually an existentialist philosopher but in the time in the 50s a lot of existential philosophers were also writing novels, writing stories that kind of represented their ideas. And one that I really enjoyed reading and that I think is very accessible is The Outsider. It is also known as The Stranger. They are the same story, just a different translation because this was originally in French. It is about a man named Merceau and he doesn't conform. He doesn't really care about the rules that are going on in life, the expectations of life, and he ends up being accused of a murder. And it's kind of how he goes through the persecution process and his complete inability to care 
or conform or see any meaning in anything that is happening. Basically, it is about a man confronting the absurdity of life, which is what Albert Camus is known for. His style of philosophy is called absurdism. So the idea that there's no meaning in life, no inherent meaning, and you also can never give life a meaning. Very fun stuff. <laughs> if I'm saying it, it sounds really sad, but it's not, trust me. But it did lead him to write a kind of more... I don't know, I feel like this book has a very detached and gloomy feeling. Um, I think I can, if I read the first sentence of the book, really gives you an idea of the vibe. And it is the following. My mother died today, or maybe yesterday. I don't know. Very famous first few lines and also really gives you an idea of the main character and kind of the vibe that you're gonna get in the rest of the book. Written in a very easy to read way, very short, so I think anyone can enjoy this. And then there's one book that I feel like I couldn't not mention in this video. It's kind of a cop-out, but it's just a good one. And that is Alice's Adventures in Wonderland by Lewis Carroll. Again, technically a children's story, but one that can still be enjoyed by many. I'm just gonna assume you all know what this is about. It's just very fun, very lighthearted, but also like full of little things that would probably go past a child, but are really fun to notice as an adult. This book is also full of puns, so many puns, language jokes. You don't need a deep understanding of literary lyricism to understand puns. I don't know if I can find an example. Like for example, when she meets a bunch of sea creatures and they tell her about the subjects that they had in school and it was things like reeling and writhing ambition, distraction, uglification, and derision. They had mystery classes and drawling. It's... Am I outing myself as someone with really bad humor? <laughs> this is the kind of stuff that makes me laugh, so now you know that. <laughs> and then, as kind of a bonus recommendation, I want to recommend fairy tales. I have Hans Christian Andersen's fairy tales. It doesn't feel like a classic, but it technically is. Yes, it's basically just children's stories. You're probably not gonna find any like deep cool meanings in these, although I don't know, some of them. It's kind of open for interpretation, but I do think if you read a bunch of kind of like classic fairy tales, it's a great way to get you used to a more old-fashioned style of writing, especially if English is not your first language, children's stories like fairy tales or Alice in Wonderland or The Little Prince can be great introductions. Okay, oh, the entire big old pile, all the little classics that I would recommend that you definitely don't need a literature degree for to understand and that I don't think are intimidating in any way. You should just pick them up. Of course, my tip, something that I often do is when I am reading a classic book is to just look up online. There's always on YouTube, you can find these animated videos that talk about the book and kind of the context of it in like five minutes. And just that little bit of context can often really make a difference in how I'm reading the book and how I'm enjoying it. So that's always a little tip. If you enjoy this video and you want to see more videos of me, babbling about books you can click the subscribe button if you want to you can also follow me on my social media i posted something in, on instagram again for the first time in weeks so <laughs> i really hope you enjoyed this little video and i will see you soon in another one goodbye